Henry packed up and moved to New York. In the next few years, he and his wife would have three children, and John Henry would build a career. And by the early 50s, he had a radio show on WCBS, the flagship station for the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was a one-hour show each afternoon, five days a week. John Henry would spin a few yarns, reminisce about his childhood in Texas, and comment on the news of the day, the frailties of this crazy human species and the foibles of the world. John Henry's New York country humor was a big success. Sophisticated city types may not have been quite certain whether they were laughing with him or at him, but that had the same trouble with Mark Twain. And for Johnny as for Twain, the trick was to use humor to convey an idea or plant a seed. He had jokes to tell, sure, but he also had ideas to share. And this was the 1950s, the time of the Cold War, loyalty oaths, Joe McCarthy. And suddenly, this soft-spoken maverick Texan sitting on top of the world found himself in big trouble on the front lines and on the front page. To Johnny, it was a matter of the U.S. Constitution, the passion of his life. He began spreading the gospel of the Constitution when he was a student at the University of Texas. Some 40 years later, he talked to Bill Moyers about that. I was at uh, William and Mary College in Williamsburg last week, oh, uh, about two weeks after you were there. And I was intrigued by all the publicity that still was following in your wake. Wasn't that nice? Yeah, you know, when you went there, they didn't know who John Henry Falk was. These undergraduates hadn't been born when you were suffering your ordeal back in the 50s. And yet, according to the press and my sources there, when you finished speaking, they gave you a standing ovation. Yeah, honey, you know, Mama had aimed me toward the Methodist ministry. But by the time I got born, she realized she shot a blank. <laughs> I had, still have an evangelical streak in me, apparently, because I used it there at that thing. I, I mean, I, I got so got to talk about the First Amendment, got to talk about the McCarthy period, and, and the trivialization of our most meaningful national experience, namely the election of our federal officers and president and on down. And I got so carried away, <laughs> I started saving souls, Bill. <laughs> I really did. I got kind of state of joy at it. Did they know what you were talking about, these uh, young kids at, uh, at this very um, traditional college? See, I do a great many college speeches, and that's the reason I do, is that I'm determined that they shall remember that, that they shall know what the McCarthy period was all about. And it's not taught in our schools. The meaning of McCarthyism has never been taught. See, it's supposed to be an anti-communist movement. It had nothing to do with communism, anti or otherwise. What was it? At that time, the use of communism, see, was a way of bolstering up, number one, the Cold War that was opening up. And number two, and most important of all, and this is terribly important to understand the McCarthy period, it was a way of shutting off the dialogue. The life's blood of this country is an open and robust dialogue, a rational political dialogue where everybody's free to say what they believe why they believe it, and to persuade their neighbor to their point of view. That is the way we move forward in our society. Well, what happened in the 50s was that the way to silence your opponent was to call him a communist. But we were told that there was an international communist conspiracy afoot, and it had its bony hand right on the White House door. And Roosevelt and that crowd of cronies that he had there were a nothing but a bunch of old communistic things. I had an aunt that said, Johnny, I just, they just scare me to death when I think they're right there in Washington, D.C., fixing to take over this government any, any day. And I said, hey, Edith, the people of this country are not going to put communists in charge of anything. You just don't know. You just don't know, Johnny. What's that story you tell about uh, when you were 12 years old, your mother sent you out to the hen house to look for the chicken snake that was harassing ah, the hen? That's, that's, well, I use that usually to illustrate something. Boots Cooper and I were law and order men. We, I was a Texas Ranger, and he was a, he was a United States Marshal. Boots. When you were playing as kids? We were both 12 years old, and we rode the frontier between Mama's back door and her hen house and the cow barn out there. We lived out in South Austin, Texas. and. Uh, Mama told us there was a chicken snake in one of the 
hen's nest out there, would we mighty lawmen go out and execute it? We both of us barefooted in overalls, and we laid aside our stick horses, got a hoe, and went in, and the hens were in a state of acute agitation, and they had the crane in their necks, and we had to stand on tiptoe to look in the top tier of nests, and about the third top nest we looked in, a chicken snake looked out of. And I don't know, Bill, whether you've ever viewed a chicken snake from the distance of six inches from the end of your nose. Not that close. But it, I, I've it, kept the The same. damn things look like a boa constrictor from that distance, although it's about the size of your finger. And uh, Boots and I, uh, all of our frontier courage drained out our uh, heels. Actually, it trickled down our overall legs. <laughs> and, and Boots and I made a new door through the hen house wall. <laughs> And Mama came out and said, well, you've lulled me into a sense of false security. I thought I was safe from all hurt and harm, and here you've let a chicken snake run you out of the hen house, and a little chicken snake at that. Don't you know chicken snakes are harmless? They can't hurt you. Boots said, yes, sir, Miss Falk, I know that. And he rubbing his forehead and his behind at the same time. said, but they can scare you so bad, it will cause you to hurt yourself. <laughs> and that's what happened. This it? is what happened to us during that period, Bill. We became so frightened of the... And our own freedoms. Yes. And see, the men who erected the protections for the individual Americans back there 200 years ago believed that we would be capable of governing ourselves. And they knew in order for us to be, they would have to make it an absolute mandate, anything of lesser, lesser force wouldn't survive the kind of crisis that they knew would come. They were men of great wisdom and vision, literate men. But they didn't put a Bill of Rights in the Constitution until the people demanded it. You know, that is lost on so many s scholars and almost uh, as many judges. <laughs> and, and I don't know, I'm not lambasting the federal judiciary, but they at least should be acquainted with how we came to have a Bill of Rights. Have you ever thought of how beautifully constructed, how wonderfully crafted that uh, that First Amendment is. Ooh, yes, I've thought of that a great, great deal. You know what it says? Literally? Yes. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition their government for the redress of grievances. Why are you, are you so passionate about the First Amendment in particular. I mean, you did bring those students at William and Mary to their feet talking about this, this cause. It puts every American citizen, whatever color, whatever walk of life, on precisely the same footing, just as your right to vote puts you on the same footing with the heads of the party, with the richest men, all the Rockefeller boys. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the First Amendment didn't protect you in the 1950s. Oh, yes, it did. You lost your job. That's right. You lost your career. What the hell is a job, huh? <laughs> There's a lot of other jobs. What the hell is a job? John Henry may say that now, but where the hell is a job is what he was saying back in the 50s. And nowhere is the answer he kept getting. John Henry built his reputation as a folklorist, as a TV and radio humorist. But the big event of his life was a drama, a drama with all the conflict one could ask for. It began with a group of right-wing vigilantes who called themselves Aware Incorporated. They set themselves up as judge and jury to decide who was fit to work in the entertainment business. One of Aware's most vocal members was Vincent Hartnett, a professional witch hunter who made a fairly good buck out of it by publishing a rag called Red Channels, which listed performers, writers, and directors that Hartnett considered subversive. Another was Lawrence A. Johnson, a grocery chain owner in Syracuse, New York, who threatened to boycott the products of any sponsor who employed those he disapproved of. They completely dominated the radio and television industry. They published periodically in this climate of fear. Boots Cooper's <laughs> truth of his statement was being proven every day up in the radio and television industry in Hollywood and New York. Uh, this climate of fear. They published a list of names of persons, artists, producers, directors, writers, and performers 
who had in the past done something that aware decided indicated less than loyalty to the United States of America. But how did aware get to you? All right. I belong to a union called AFTRA. And I had in the union, I got up a slate of officers because the, the leadership of our union was all pro-aware. And the membership of the union had been so decimated by aware's attacks that they, because uh, aware did this for money. They made money out of this, you see. This fellow Hartnett made a, a lot of money. How do you make money? By charging the networks and the advertising agencies to clear names. Your name had to be cleared by aware. That's how powerful it had become. So what did you do? You organized? I organized this group of members. We, we'd sit around bellyache about the injustice of, how, of, of, of blacklisting. But if you even criticized the House Committee or the FBI, you were candidate for blacklisting. This man is critical of the FBI. Really, that's the way they'd list it. Uh, and so we, uh, I, I raised this Gideon's army of guys, all of whom expressed their indignation to me, and I said, well, let's run against We ran and swept into office. Your slate yes. won the elections of the local yes, union. Yes, and the and national and union. The national union was controlled by the right wing, these McCarthyites, rigid McCarthyites. And our local had been a, a shameful bunch. So what happened to you? Their own fellow members get blacklisted, destroyed. See, the function of a union isn't to help aware blacklist people, but to protect performers' jobs. That's the only reason a guy pays union fees, you see. As, uh, or any union man supposedly pays union wages, uh, or union, union dues, is to get the protection of the union for his job and his working conditions. I got this bunch together. We ran in the fall of 1955 and swept into office. And Charlie Collingwood, bless his old sweetheart, became president. And uh, I became a vice president. Old Orson Bean became a vice president. And we were going to save the world. And of course, it made headlines then, Bill. This is back in 1956. Literally, any blacklist slate wins. The following week, the House and american Activities Committee, true to its form, published a statement, communists taking over the entertainment industry under the guise of anti-blacklist. And it scared the jumping daylights out of these people, some of the people that had run with me. We'd run a pretty big slate and had pretty big support. God called me up and said, don't, don't mention that I supported the slate. Please don't. You know, this was a level of fear is what it had done to the people. And then, aware, after the House Committee roughed us up, old Ed Murrah and Charlie Collingwood and I sat down to figure out what kind of response to make. We got up in Burroughs' office, and I said, let me respond to them. They said, no, 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 you get too, you get too mad. We want a measured response. <laughs> They'll take their hides off, but, uh, and Charlie's more eloquent, which was absolute fact. So Charlie wrote a response, and it was a smashing one, to the House Committee. You tend to your own business. We tend to union business. You're not only this is this false, but it's, improper that you would be meddling in our affairs. So Aware then put out a bulletin on us and says, this middle of the road slate, see, we pledged that we weren't communist or anything and weren't going to eat any children or anything ugly and go church regular if they just left our slate. Uh, this middle of the road slate alleges that it's not communist. But let's look at, perhaps it isn't a communist movement, but let's look at some of the leadership for instance, John Henry Falk, who organized it. And then they went to town on me. They alleged five different things that I'd done, two of which were the, true. I'd done them, that I'd appeared at a dinner at the Astor Hotel in 1946 with a known communist and never repudiated that appearance. It was the year one birthday party for the United Nations Security Council. That was when Trigva Lee was Secretary of General of the United Nations Security Council. And it was under the sponsorship of that well-known left-wing outfit called the American Bar Association and about 25 other similarly left-wing <laughs> organizations. And, uh, and that was the event they said that I had attended and that there was a known communist there and uh, they didn't mention that he was a member of the Security Council named Andre Gromenko, who was just as un-American as you can get. 
the Soviet foreign minister. Yes. And it was being broadcast full network.